Hey guys, hope you're all doing good. So in the last couple of videos, we looked at how to formulate the ordinary differential equation system for a, a reacting flow case, right? And then we also looked at a couple of techniques that can be used to solve ordinary differential equations and they are primarily the implicit and explicit method. So first, we are just going to summarize what we have learned so far and then we are basically going to work on topics where we can use both of these two techniques, that is solving the ordinary differential equations and then uh, solving it for the reacting system right we are going to combine these two techniques and march forward uh, as far as the key differences are concerned between the implicit and explicit methods implicit method is going to give you the advantage of being more stable whereas explicit method is going to be much more easier to code and maybe a bit faster as well right now for stiff systems which is typically what happens in reacting flow cases or whenever there is chemistry involved you most likely use an implicit method which can also be called as the backward difference method all right, I hope that makes sense. So now uh, what we are going to do is we are going to kind of put in all these pieces together, right? So you actually have an ordinary differential equation system. And for simplicity, what I've done is I've just assumed that we have three ordinary differential equations, right? dy1 by dt, dy2 by dt, dy3 by dt, right? So you're solving for y1, y2 and y3. And you can think of these as the species, right? So y1 can be carbon dioxide, y2 can be carbon monoxide and Y3 can be your fuel species, right? And what we're basically saying here is we're saying that how the concentration of Y1, Y2 and Y3 are going to change with respect to time. Now, if you pay attention to this ODE system, this is what you called as a coupled ODE system. What does that mean? If you take a look at the first ODE, you're solving for Y1, right? But you can see that on the right hand side, Y2 is involved and we have a separate ODE for Y2 which means you cannot solve the first ODE separately and then use those results to solve the second ODE, right? That's not going to happen. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, your second ODE, it contains Y3, which basically has its own ODE, right? And if you look at ODE number one, it also has Y3 in it, right? So the system is coupled and hence you need to integrate the system completely. The implicit and explicit techniques that we looked at, we were just integrating a single ODE. So what is the technique that we need to use so we are going to basically develop a technique that you can use when you have a system of ODE. All right. So if you look at this first ODE, you can basically say that, you know, Y1 new is equal to Y1 old plus A1 Y1 plus A2 Y2 Y3 multiplied by delta T. Now, this would be the case if you're doing explicit integration. Now, similarly, uh, Y2 new would be equal to Y2 old. Plus, if you actually look at this particular term in the brackets, it's it's nothing but the function, right? So you can say that the right hand side here is F1, the right hand side here is F2, and the right hand side here is F3. When I say right hand side, I'm just uh, taking these terms, right? So I can basically say that this is F2 times delta T and Y3 new equal to Y3 old plus f3 times delta t right so in general uh, if you see the pattern is quite simple i can say that yi and instead of new i can call it as n plus 1 is equal to yi at time level n plus uh, function of i multiplied by delta t right where i is going to go from 1 to 3 in this particular case and n and n plus 1 refers to time so if n is your current time n plus 1 is your next level of time so if you have to put in some numbers you know use this formula let us say that n is equal to 1 right if you say n equal to 1 then you get the following equations y12 is equal to y11 plus fi delta t similarly y y22 is equal to y21 plus f2 of delta t f2 multiplied by delta t sorry and this needs to be f1 i hope that makes sense Right. So that's a very simple update rule that we can follow. All right. So the equations that we discussed in the whiteboard are for the explicit method. Now, what about the implicit method? Well, in the implicit method, you are going to be using backward differencing. So you are going to get a very similar looking equation set. The only difference is that on the right hand side, when you evaluate the function, the function is also evaluated at the current time step. So the only known term is y10, y20 and y30, right? because you get that from the initial conditions. The every other term needs to be computed and that is why it's going to form a system of three nonlinear coupled equations. All right, so how do we solve this? Well, we are going to be using the newton raphson technique, but since we have multiple equations, we have to use the multivariate newton raphson 
So let's take a look at that. So what we need to do is, so multivariate Newton Raphson is fairly straightforward. Uh, you start with an initial value, right? So in this case, I have uh, an initial array of values, right? Because there are three ODEs, so I need to have three guess values, right? I put them in a column matrix, and that's what I call as y volt. So you can kind of check it out here. Now I can use the y volt values, and I can take that, and I can. Uh, so this needs to be a negative sign. So then you have your under relaxation factor alpha, and uh, your Jacobian matrix. Uh, for which you have taken an inverse. The reason why you have a Jacobian matrix and not a simple derivative is because you have a, a function uh, that's dependent on multiple variables, right? Uh, so when we looked at plain old Newton Raphson, we just had a single derivative because the function f was dependent on only a single variable, but here it's not the case. So you have a Jacobian matrix and you take the inverse of it, and then you have your function f, right? Which is also going to be a column matrix. So if you expand it a little bit, you're going to start with guess values for these guys, right? And then uh, you'll compute your Jacobian matrix. You can use an under relaxation factor, and then you can compute the new values. And you kind of repeat this process again and again. So the important thing that you need to understand here is that for each and every time step, you get a system of nonlinear equations. So for example, here I've written the equation for n equal to one, and you get a system of nonlinear equations. You need to solve that first. And then you make your time advance. When you go to your second time step, and then you have another nonlinear system for which you have to again use your multivariate Newton Raphson technique. So that is why this process is a bit complex and can quickly go costly when you have a large number of ordinary differential equations to solve. All right. So before solving the entire ordinary differential equation system, let's take up a much more easier problem, which is kind of in the middle, right? So far, we know how to solve ODEs and we know how to incorporate uh, Newton Raphson for single variables but we have never done Newton Raphson for a multivariate system and that's what we are going to do now. So what I have on screen is I have a system of three nonlinear equations. Why are they called nonlinear? So here obviously you're trying to solve for x1, x2 and x3. Those two variables that you're trying to solve are getting multiplied with each other which makes it nonlinear. And you can see that almost all of these equations have terms like that. For example, you have x1 square here, you have x2 square here and you have x1 times x2 here. Now, how are we going to solve it? In order to solve this particular problem, I've already written a Python code. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here's the program. So you can see that I'm getting started by adding some comments. So this is my nonlinear system that I'm trying to solve. I've written down the equation. Now you can see that I'm importing a couple of handy functions. So the first thing that you will notice is that we have imported NumPy. This is used for performing matrix manipulations and calculations. And then from the linear algebra package of NumPy. So when I say NumPy.LINALG, this stands for linear algebra, right? So that is why it's called LIN, linear ALG algebra. We are taking the linear algebra package from NumPy and we are importing a function called INV, which stands for inverse. Why do we need that? If you remember from the slides, we need to calculate the inverse for the Jacobian, right? And that is where this is being used. So once I have this, uh, I'm starting with defining my functions. So you can see that f1 basically returns the first expression, 3x1 minus cos of x2, x3 minus 1.5, right? So that's what f1 is doing. Uh, the same thing is happening to f2, and the same thing is being done to f3 as well. So once I do that, what I'm doing is I'm computing my Jacobian. So what is a Jacobian matrix? So to put it simply, Jacobian matrix keeps track of all possible derivatives for a particular function that we have. So let us say you have a function f, which is say x square, right? Then the only possible derivative that you have is df by dx, correct? But what if you have a function that is a function of two variables? So then two derivatives are possible, df by dx and df by dy, correct? And what if you have multiple functions, f1, f2, and f3, which are all kind of dependent on the same function, right? Something like this. In that case, you can actually compute df1 by dx, df1 by dy, df2 by dx, df2 by dy, df3 by dx, and df3 by dy, correct? Now you put them in a matrix, that's what you call as the Jacobian matrix. So it kind of contains all the possible derivatives for a particular system, right? So now you can see that the dimensions of the matrix depends upon 
the number of functions that you have. So in this case, you have three functions and that is why you have three rows. So this is row number one, row number two, row number three. So if you don't know what a row is, a row is basically the horizontal entity, right? So you have three horizontal entities here, correct? Um, that's because you have three functions and you have two dependent variables, X and Y, and that's why you have two columns. So now going back to our original function, you can see that I have three functions. So that means I will have three rows and I have three dependent variables, x1, x2 and x3, which means I will have three columns. So in other words, my Jacobian matrix is going to be a three cross three matrix. All right. So that is why you can see that I first created a three by three matrix and I'm using NP dot ones of three comma three. So what this basically does is it creates a matrix of three rows and three columns where each and every element is set to one. So that's what ones of three comma three does. So then what I'm doing is I'm computing the row one of my Jacobian matrix. So from the slides, it's fairly clear that the first row is going to be df1 by dx1, df1 by dx2 and df1 by dx3. In other words, we take the first function and we differentiate with all of the independent variables, which are x1, x2 and x3. So how do you compute this? Well, you have your function here. Now, the only thing you need to do is you need to first differentiate this with respect to x1. I'll kind of show this to you. So if you take this particular guy and if you differentiate it with respect to x1, the only term that you will have is 3, correct? Because every other term is going to fall up to 0. So then when you take this equation and differentiate it with respect to x2, then you will have sine of x2, x3 multiplied by x3. Now the negative sign is going to go away because when you differentiate the cosine function, you get an additional negative sign, which, which is going to nullify the negative sign that's already present. Finally, let's take the same expression and differentiate it with respect to x3. You're going to get the same term, except that the factor is going to be x2 instead of x3, right? I hope that makes sense. So in a similar way, we are basically computing uh, the row two and row three of the Jacobian matrix. And that's basically it. After that, it's quite straightforward. I first define my guess values for x1, x2, and x3, right? Now you can think of these as the initial mole fractions of the species, right? But in this case, uh, this particular multivariate system does not represent a reacting system. So the values here do not represent the mole fraction. You can just think of it as mole fraction. That's all I'm saying. So you have x1, x2, and x3, uh, and then we define our error parameter to make sure that we have a criteria to stop our newton raphson solver. And then what I'm doing is I'm creating a vector, right? So x1, x2, x3 are three variables, right? What I'm doing is I'm creating a column matrix, which has three rows and one column. And I'm using np.ones, which is going to again create a matrix, which contains uh, one, one, and one, right? 